dude. Let's say it is Each year we hold field events here at the Proving Grounds in Southwest Missouri. This is a great way for folks to get hands-on experience of how we manage habitat and the critters, plus our hunting techniques. These events are a great time to visit with folks literally from all throughout the Whitetails range and pick up tips from how they manage their property and get all kind of goodies from the partners here at Growing Deer. And we're going to finish covering that trap up with the dirt. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops, Reconyx, Trophy Rock, Eagle Seed, Nikon, Winchester, Dead Downwind, Antler Dirt, Lacrosse Footwear, Blood Sport Arrows, Flatwood Natives, Morel Targets, Caldwell, Hooks Custom Calls, Montana Decoy, Summit Tree Stands, Drake, Non Typical, House Lubricator, LEM Game Processing, Fourth Arrow, G5 Broadhead. Prime bows and redneck hunting blinds. Deep breath, let it breathe. She keeps walking. I may get a tight this time as she walks through. Move it over, hit record, let it record for another 10 seconds. Adam started out early Friday morning hosting a camera school for our pro staff. Bird, he's still on the roost. I'm going to have him kind of position himself. It's a great time to get him all up to speed on the latest filming techniques for turkey hunts. I'd have to, I'd have to, I'd have to get you. Well, we, we still thought there was still some that you could take out of there. So that's when this material was introduced. You know, by doing so, we were able to create a bow that, you know, you're, I think you'd be very impressed with if you give it a shot. Friday afternoon, we had an archery course set up, and many of the attendees were excellent shots, even in the windy conditions. Yo, you want to shoot the coyote load? Yeah, sure. Okay, go ahead and find your coyote. All right. Winchester also had a rifle and a shotgun course set up, and everyone got to shoot a gong at about 200 yards across the valley, and check out the new Winchester coyote load. Following day, we had a full schedule with stops all throughout the proving grounds. The morning started out chilly, but we all huddled around Keelan from Flatwood Natives, and he did a great job explaining how to prune, fertilize, and manage the tree plot for maximum production. I gotta tell you, it was a little distracting as I was listening to Keelan and hearing turkeys gobble in the distance. When you buy our trees, you get, a, you get the tree protector package it comes with, a uh, slow release fertilizer, which is an 1899. So I would recommend if you have older trees, going with a simple 10, 10, 10 fertilizer. A good tip to, to see if they need fertilizer is if they don't have 10 to 12 inches of new growth in a year's time, they need fertilizer. And you want to apply that around the edge of the root ball or around the, the, the canopy drip line, whichever is greater. How long do you uh, leave a tree tube on a tree usually? Uh, how many years? Or... So these tree tubes are designed, they're pre-perforated. They're designed to bust away basically when the tree grows and puts pressure on them, they'll, they'll oh, perforate okay. away. But you can remove them before that when you feel like they're stable and the deer and critters are not going to tear them up. Do you want the tree sticking out of the tube or you want, I mean, cut it off where it's actually sticking out or does it matter because the whole thing's covering the tree yet? No, that's the point of the, the tree tube is to promote upward growth. So let it grow up and grow out. How much room do you want in between your fruit trees? Depending on the species and the size, um, anywhere from 15 to 30, 35 feet. You don't, what you don't want to do is get them too close where they're competing for each other. Watering the first year. Depending on what, it, what it's like, you want to try to water them as much as you can. If you don't have any moisture in your soil, water them somehow. Whether it's pumping out of a creek to do some irrigation or you have a water tanker somewhere you can pull. But watering is very important for the first year. You want to keep those, you want to keep them trees happy. Tree plots can be a tremendous attraction to whitetails. I like to plant fruit trees that mature early, mid, and late fall so they come to the tree plot throughout the entire season.
When Keelan finished up, we moved down the hill just a bit where Clint Carey, a great trapper, put on an excellent demonstration on how to catch coyotes. The biggest thing about coyote trapping or any kind of trapping is the time invested. So the first thing I would say is keep that in mind. If you want to start trapping and you buy three dozen traps and you have another job, it's going to be hard to keep all that working. So keep it to where you can maintain it because it's a lot of work. If you can get out six sets and maintain them and still enjoy trapping by doing it, then those six sets are going to do better than going out and buying a lot, of a lot of traps and trying to have to be out there every day doing something. Coyote spends lots of times on the roads. If you're out there deer hunting, you see the scat on roads, you see the tracks, that's where your coyotes are. That's where you need to be trapping. One, it's a time saver for you too. If you're on your property, you can ride, check traps. It just makes it all that much simpler. Plus, it's where the coyotes are. Number one thing, we gotta have the coyote step on this pan to catch him. You want him to step on it like you stepping on a log and you feel like it's safe, you put your weight on it and then it falls. Okay, so you get a good catch on that coyote. Okay, I don't dig out a hole this big. If you do that, you're gonna have to fill that in because we want this trap, when we get it in this bed, to not have any rock, okay? We don't want it doing this. You want it when you push on this corner, nothing happens. We're gonna set this trap down in it and kind of beat it in a little bit. And you see there, we have no movement virtually there. This goes over the pan like so. But that is simply to protect that pan from getting anything under it so the trap can continue to fire. This is peat moss. You can pick it up from garden sections. All right. It really, really resists rain nicely. I'm gonna sift that over this trap and then I'm taking this dirt and I like around a half inch of dirt covering. Now I'm gonna start packing that dirt down and I leave that over the pan, the only really soft spot. Now that really stands out. Where's the trap at? Anybody, right, right there. there. That's exactly where it's at. <laughs> so I just gathered up some of this right here grass and we're gonna start covering it up with that. And you basically just want that trap to look somewhat like everything around it. I'm just gonna punch a hole about that deep, it looks like. <laughs> I'm going to waller it out right there. <laughs> I made this up. It's got a little eye peel. It's just a stick with some pillow stuffing on it. I use quite a bit of lure in most places. I would take a gob about like this, and I would shove it in that hole. Now in this hole, I would take a gob of bait, and I would shove it down in there. All right, this is just urine, coyote urine. <laughs> clarify that. I'm just going to squirt that on this. All right. Now then, we've got three different odors coming from this one area. Okay. The wind's blowing this away across that road. Coyote running down that road where you all are standing. What happens? Nothing at all happens. Exactly. So you can either take this and give it, start out there at the road and start giving a trail basically to right here with the urine. Um, there's lots of different things you can use. I've used cooking grease before. We've got this product, and I just take spoonfuls, handfuls, whatever, and just, just like that, out there in the road, and bring them right here to your trap. As we moved down the mountain, Brad Doyle did a great job talking about eagle seed for its soybeans. Brad explains the marriage of soybeans, fertilization, and good soil management. Understanding this relationship and managing appropriately can add lots of protein and help you grow bigger deer and larger antlers. It's a legume crop, so it can actually take atmospheric nitrogen, nitrogen from the air, and through its roots with this bacteria, has a symbiotic relationship, it can produce nitrogen. Well, nitrogen content of the leaf, the bean, the stalk, that's what we measure protein. And that's what he wants. He wants the most available, uh, digestible protein he can get. And this plant's out here working 24 hours a day. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't introduce that bacteria to the soil, it, won't, it, it just uses nitrogen that's available. So it's always important, especially on a new field that's your first time introduction uh, to soybeans, inoculate that seed. It can only be put on the seed. You can't come back and spray it later. Soil testing is cheap for the amount of fertilizer that you're going to spend or that you could save 
to pay for a soil test. The difference between buying triple 13 fertilizer, commercial based fertilizer, that's all it has is NP and K in it. You have to request sulfur or boron or manganese or magnesium extra. One thing Grant's doing with his, his uh, composted litter, his antler dirt, it has tons of those things, a lot of micro or a lot of biological uh, cooties, if you want to call them, that, that are extra. Um, so that's one of the values of using that type of product versus just commercial fertilizer. It's a huge advantage. Also, the organic matter he's bringing in. Uh, he's, bring, he's spreading organic matter. He's also growing organic matter. So all these stems and stalks, all the, if you just think about all the root structure that's growing down here, you know, there may be, in his case, might be 12 inches of root. Uh, so we're, we've got all these root channels. He is not tilling here, so he has a perfect scenario. Um, every, every crop he grows, the roots are going to be more free to grow. As I like to say, big antlers start in the dirt. When you treat the soil right and add eagle seed forage soybeans, that's the best recipe I know to provide quality forage and tons of protein almost year round for your deer herd. It made sense to follow up seeds with how we plant them. So the next stop was the Genesis no-till drill and that generated a lot of excitement. But antler dirt has made us grow such tremendous crops in this bottom, I see how dark this weed is, everything's going good. That's what's building the dirt, just like the Great Prairies. Grows up, we terminate the crop or it dies like the beans, it decomposes on top of the ground. Earthworms come up and just eat that and turn it into wonderful vermiculture. If you're buying it's called vermiculture or vermipost, tremendous fertilizer. And so we build a system and when you're disking, you're literally killing earthworms by the billions. We love earthworms. If, I'm sure if Adam or somebody pulled up a big clump of wheat or something here, we'd find some earthworms in it. They're just, we have a tremendous earthworm population. We've just built the right habitat for worms, and the worms are taking care of a lot of everything else we got going on. So we drilled right out there in the middle, right through four foot tall beans. We just, we didn't mow them, we just drilled right through them. And the beans that survived, great. The beans that don't survive, the broadside grows. And so when they come to me, literally, because everyone thinks we would just trying to make money or whatever, y'all know I'm really candid. His boss actually called me up and said, hey, I'm with the turf company, and I've been watching going deer, and we got this idea for no-till drill, and I'm thinking, turf company? And we thought, well, we're going to tear the drill up, and they're going to go home and, you know, done with that little headache. <laughs> and so Adam and I played with the drill for several hours, and it wasn't what we wanted, but we didn't tear it up. It had cultures every three inches for planting turf grass and a lot of things for the turf industry. And they've been very patient, so we're on, I think, the seventh, I, don't, I think it's the seventh version. There's seed in here, so you'll be able to see how deep it's planting the seed and what's going on. <coughs> and you can tell we're just cut stuff, makes a slit puts the seed at the right depth, and you can adjust the depth on there, and then packs over the top of it. As we've shared for years, using a no-till drill is a great technique for conserving soil moisture, reducing soil compaction, and reducing the amount of trips required to go across the field. All in all, it's just a superior technique to planting. The next stop, Brad and Jimmy explained the shot lock technology used in the long beard and the new coyote load. They did a little demo at 20 and 50 yards, and whether you understand the technology or not, the pattern sure made it clear it was superior. We liked how long beard worked really well. You know, it, it, it puts the hammer on turkeys. It uh, got a lot of good reviews. Um, we decided to put that in a, in a coyote load as well. Uh, so. We have a, a new load, it's 12 gauge, three inch. It's got a BB shot, you get about 75 uh, BBs in a, in a load. We got a turkey on top and a coyote on bottom. And I also have a 50 yard target set up with the uh, same situation, a turkey on top and a coyote on the bottom. So the first shot we're gonna take is gonna be with uh, the Longbeard Magnum loads. The, the Magnum's actually just came out this year. 
So they're just like the uh, standard long beards, but you're gonna have another eighth ounce of shot. Everybody ready? I think we got him. Let's go ahead and uh, shoot that same that coyote at 20 yards as well. Range is hot. I think we got him too. Range is hot. I don't know if you guys can see that, but there's several pellets in that turkey's brain. Range is hot. They also shared a great tip that that same technology is used in their rooster load. It's a two and three quarter shell and great to use for youngsters or anyone that's a little bit recoil sensitive. In fact, my daughter Ray tagged a great Tom at 41 yards with that load last season. You know how we love to hunt pinch points, but there's not many here in the hardwoods but Kyle and Jeff from Battenfield did a great job of demonstrating how a hot zone fence can be used to make a pinch point and cool techniques on how to maintain them and get the most out of that tool. Just so happens about 20 yards from a redneck blind. It's not cheating, but it's pretty close to it. And the fence, even I can jump it. I'm not real coordinated, but it done a great job obviously of keeping deer out because by hunting season, the beans outside the fence were pretty much hurting. And inside, guys, this crop, if you'd have saw it with full pods, I'm gonna say it made at least literally 50 bushels per acre. It, it was just, they were just loaded, loaded with beans from the ground up. It's stunning. We had some great video of bucks and does just, you know, circling around and coming through the gate. So this, the strategy is real simple. Uh, the, the Hot Zone brand actually Everyone wants to cheat, buy something else. Puts out 11 joules. And if you're not into electricity, 11 joules mean if you put a wet nose here, blue fire comes out the back end. <laughs> it's really hot. And it won't hurt you. It, you know, it's not like it's gonna kill you or your kids. I've had Adam touch it several times, so he's okay. And we literally have, I mean, literally have some Reconnex video of a yearling buck going up at night and you see him and you know deer always how do deer approach stuff with their nose right they don't reach out with their paw so they got the old wet nose use it at night when the humidity's up so electricity travels better and you see him doing that and literally you can see a blue arc jump from the fence to his nose and that deer you know he went somewhere in Arkansas I think <laughs> you're opening up when it's a limited resource and, and they're finding it quick. You know, deer live by their nose. They know there's food in here. They just gotta find that hole. A traditional cow fence is about 8,000 volts and about 0.8 stored joules. Um, this Energizer is 12,000 volts and has 2.7 stored joules. So you definitely don't wanna touch it. The, the real problem is if you let the, the, ground, the ground cover grow up and touch it, as soon as the plant touches it, it's just like a deer touching it and it's, it's hitting a draw on that battery. If you do like Grant does, going around the weed eaters or spraying and you keep the uh, beans or whatever you're growing from coming up and touching the fence, it'll last like Grant said for months at a time. This fence I think is what, four years old, Kyle? Yeah. Is this one four? I mean, this was this one you're looking at. You can tell the clips are kind of getting rusty. Other than that, we're good to go. These guys, you gonna be at lunch, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Come. Around, Feel free. So. Okay, to be here at lunch. Speaking of getting the most out of it, a lot of our partners had great giveaways while they were here. I noticed several of the attendees loading their truck as they left the proving grounds. After all that learning, we headed back up the mountain for a great catered lunch, lots of storytelling, and a little rest before we headed back out to learn more. Just because you decide on this system doesn't mean that you can't run smaller arms off the same system because every single shoulder is the same for all the systems at any time. Calvin from Fourth Arrow introduced a brand new camera arm they've designed. And I gotta tell you, the entire Growing Deer team is super pumped 
to start using that camera arm versus the heavy clunky thing we've been using. So we really revolutionized from a two-piece system into a three-piece system, therefore allowing you to keep a base in every tree no matter how many sets you have. If you're used to one of those other products, you're used to a base that can cost $100 to $200. This right now is what we've got for a base. So inside that, inside that base mounts your second piece, your, your shoulder. So you've got your base, your shoulder, and your arm. This shoulder basically slips in just like you're seeing this setup here slips in right there. I mean, if you wanted to, you could literally put your base upside down, but any angle of any branch, tree, whatever, we've got, this is one of the larger versions that holds up to a 20 pound camera, can hold up something similar to these guys' cameras. Um, and then the, whereas the two smaller arms passed around are more built for the, the light duty camera arm. So another problem filming hunts, and this is something that, uh, that Grant and Adam mentioned to us was basically getting that point of view if we all watch the videos from growing deer, you quickly realize that one of their most important camera angles in filming a hunt to tell the story is to get that, is to get the interaction back on the, the hunter and the cameraman. So basically you can just run this out. And now you've got uh, a point of view system that can be up high out of the hunter's way and uh, not endanger your life trying to get out to that branch, which in many cases, you don't even have that branch that you can go to. If you self film or film with the hunting buddy, you wanna check out the fourth row camera arm and consider joining the Growing Deer Field Staff. Okay, TJ is with red end blinds. If you've been looking around the property, we obviously love red end blinds, we got them all over. Blinds are a great way, as Grant alluded to, to introduce kids, you know, if you if you have a, a, a young nephew, a son, daughter, I have a four-year-old girl, um, you know, it's just a great way to introduce them. And besides that, with our blinds, uh, they'll contain your scent, hide your movement. Um, with our blinds, there's a, you know, compared to the other things that are out there, we use automotive tempered glass. We don't use plexiglass. So our windows are never gonna oxidize and get foggy. It's not gonna scratch. Uh, as you can see, it's weather gasket stripping on all the windows, all the doors. Uh, our blinds are 100% fiberglass construction. If you look at the bottom of our blind, there is absolutely nothing but fiberglass anywhere that is out in the elements. There's nothing that's going to rot, nothing that's going to mold. Our blinds we built to last you your lifetime. Uh, the warranty on the fiberglass blinds is a lifetime warranty. It's up to 25 years from the day that you buy your blind, there's no other blind out on the market that does that. And that's because we have the quality and we stand behind our product. Uh, new this year, we added acoustic foam inside, all along the inside, the top and the bottom, whereas it used to be carpet. Now we added that sound insulation and also our, excuse me, that sound deadening along with the insulation. Uh, it's just another factor that we've done with the blinds. We're always constantly looking to improve the product. You're dear, you're dead. A really neat presentation was from the guys at Hook's Custom Calls. They brought several world champion callers with them, and before we got there, some of those callers got up in the woods, hid, and then started calling when we got to the station. Later they came down and shared some amazing techniques of how they make those vocalizations. The messenger grunt call is here. After months of designing, testing, and tweaking, James Harrison from Hook's Custom Calls absolutely knocked a home run on this grunter. One morning I get an email from Grant and it says, in church yesterday, I believe I came up with the name. We are going to name this call The Messenger. And he explained to me. So now I'm going to let him explain to you and then we're gonna let James blow that grunt that literally brought that deer up the hill a while ago. It was incredible. We were all setting up there waiting on you guys to get here. We go, 
what's coming up the hill? What's cutting? James had just got done Granny. So we'll let Grant explain what that's for. You don't want to blow, I'm a five-year-old buck. If you come over here, I'm going to kill you. That doesn't result in a lot, where a lot of us hunters, not to meet five-year-old challengers, that doesn't result in a lot of deer running in to take the doe away. We want to be a two-year-old that feels like he's got some oats to him, but three, fours, and fives are going to come in and instantly look for that receptive doe. So when we started meeting, you know, we'd explain in biological terms, and they would talk in call terms, and we literally, Adam and Daniel and Clay and a bunch of other guys, went out several times during the summer with a big box full of calls. I don't know if you brought them, Adam, or not, but big box fulls of all the commercial calls we could buy, and somebody get, you know, down, 50, we did 50, 100, 150, and 200 yards. And one thing that blew out right off the bat was a lot of calls, if you blow it loud enough to go 200 yards, it's squeaking. It totally blows out. The reed blows out. And the others were so deep that if you blew them to get that, the, tent, the sound may not blow out, but it didn't sound like a deer. It wasn't communicating what it wanted to communicate. And if you're watching the video, before there was ever a name, these were onesies made by James. Where is James? James went up right up there. Speaking. Onesies made by James. I mean, just literally onesies at a time, they changing. I don't know all the terms, the tone board and the read. And so James, I want it to do X, Y, Z. This is what I want. And I want to be able to blow on as hard as I can and not squeak. And I want to be able to soft blow it when they're close so they can't get my location. When Adam and I first started talking about this project, we reviewed all the video footage we had of bucks grunting. And we knew the most attractive sound we could have in the woods was of a two-year-old buck tending a receptive doe. What buck wants to run into a five-year-old buck tending a doe because there's a good chance he's going to get whipped. But a two-year-old buck, wherever three, four, and five-year-old knows he can steal that doe readily. Let's see if we can get James to... That sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, nothing commercial, that just sounds good. Being a master call builder, James did a great job with the reed, getting in where it works close range, and also will sound great when that buck's traveling across the field. We moved on around the mountain, and Gene Price from Trophy Rock took a lot of miss out of Trophy Rock Mineral. What I'm gonna be talking about today mostly is 465, and it's directly related to trophy rock because 465 is simply just ground up trophy rock is all it is. There's no difference. We don't add anything to our products or anything. It's, it's truly an all natural product, has 65 plus trace minerals in it. There's only three deposits in the world that we know of. One's in Pakistan, one's in Austria, and we have the only one in this continent in North America, it's in Utah. That large chunk of trophy rock is really difficult for us. You know, it takes a lot of labor to get that one size rock where this is like kind of all automated and we can go through it a lot faster so we can sell this to you at a lot better price. So like that question is our number one question we get. I have 100 acres, how many sites do I need? There's a lot of factors into that. We can generally say 50 to 100 acres, somewhere in that range, one mineral site. But I've seen some 100 acre tracks to where it almost made sense, and I didn't encourage them to do this, but it almost made sense to have three mineral sites. You know, because you have different lands, different topography, you have a river bottom, you have fields and ridges, kind of different deer using those. You know, if you have, if you have 15 or 20 deer using a site, a lot of times you'll have, you know, a dominant doe, you know, in, in that herd, you'll have a dominant buck in that herd. They might spend a lot of time at that site. They'll push everything else off. You know, they'll keep everything else away and, and your other deer will not be getting the benefit from it. So yeah, so, so you just really, it's just really a custom tailoring. You have to pay attention to several different aspects. That's probably the most important one, what Grant said. It's just watching. If you're getting 50, 40 deer using one site, you absolutely need another one. A lot of folks don't realize it's mined in the USA. There's no processing to it. And it's the only deposit known in the USA that's that rich in trace minerals. What I'd like to do today is give you a demonstration of a mechanical versus a fixed blade on the target I have set up back there. Um, I think we're going to see some uh, 
unique results. Um, and I'm sure everyone has kind of an idea on, on what's going to happen. So we'll, we'll just let the, uh, uh, let the shooting do the talking for us on that one. Tim Check Rossi gave a demonstration on three different types of broadheads. And I got to tell you, even I was amazed. I'm going to start with the fixed blade. This is the 100 grain G5 Montec. Tim took a five gallon bucket, filled it full of sand, and shot a fixed blade, a three bladed mechanical, and a two bladed mechanical into that bucket at about 30 yards. And that was a three blade broadhead. What I'm gonna do to try and even the playing field, next broadhead is going to be the T3, it's a three blade mechanical. And for comparison, the last one is gonna be a two blade G5 Havoc. Okay, let's go take a look. Not only was I impressed that Tim could make great shots with about 125 folks watching, but he really educated me on how effective a two blade mechanical broadhead can be. So we didn't get, um, actually the bottom one, the Havoc was the one that uh, penetrated the furthest. That was the two blade mechanical. Uh, the T3, this, this was the, the Havoc, the T3, and this was the Montec. Uh, Strangely enough, the uh, fixed blade Montec didn't penetrate as quite as deep as the T3 expandable or the uh, two blade Havoc. However, this being a bucket and with sand filled in it, you know that's still going to be a, a lot of knockdown. Power. I admit, when he started shooting arrows, I kind of thought the fixed blade might have the deepest penetration going through that thick five gallon bucket and all that sand. But it was all said and done, the Havoc had the best penetration. The thing is, it really boils down to a lot of personal preference when it comes to selecting a broadhead. I think that plays more into it than, than anything. Um, it's hard to pick. Um, Adam and I have used a Havoc broadhead for a couple years now and have enjoyed really good success. But after that demonstration, there's no doubt the Havoc broadheads will be on the end of my Bloodsport Arrows this fall. We hope you join us for a field event. The next one's scheduled for August 12th and 13th. We'll be drilling down on our habitat management techniques and exactly how and why we place our stands and the hunting techniques we use. I hope you have an opportunity to get outside and enjoy creation with a family member or friend this week. But most importantly, find time each day to be quiet and listen to what the Creator is saying to you. Thanks for watching Growing Deer.